Hi guys, um, this is going to be a Principles of Flight talk about uh, airflow and Bernoulli's theorem. So the first thing we need to understand is air, air itself. So let's just get that, let's get that. Now air has a certain number of properties. It is a fluid. By that what we mean is it's something that contains a lot of molecules of air um, you can move through it, they freely pass around things. However, one of the things that's important to realise, uh, or two of the things, is the first thing is it can be compressed. And the second thing is that it has inertia. And those two things will become apparent. So over here we've got uh, an aerofoil, um, and there's a couple of things we need to... Uh, basically highlight on it and I'm going to try and use consistent colors throughout so the first thing is all aerofoils have what's called a cord line and the cord line runs from the leading edge of the aerofoil which is that point there right at the front to the point known as the trailing edge which is the point right at the back now you can see from that it doesn't actually follow the contour of the aerofoil it is a reference line that we use and it literally goes from the leading edge to the trailing edge. So that's your cord line. What we've got on here uh, as part of our diagram is we've got the trailing edge there. And we've got our leading edge. Now, there's another line that's um, not too important aerodynamically. Um, however, it, it is something that uh, potentially comes up uh, when discussing it. And this is this line here. So I'll draw what appears to be the same line um, from there. But then what I'm going to do is, in fact, let's get rid of that. It starts at the leading edge goes to the trailing edge just like the cord line however what it does is it follows the midpoint it's equidistant between the top surface of the wing and the lower surface of the wing and that uh, is known as the mean camber line so that's the mean camber line so those really are the four key reference points that you'd have on the wing so you've got the leading edge right at the front you've got the trailing edge which is the edge at the back you've got the cord line which is a straight line drawn between the leading edge and the trailing edge and then you've got the mean camber line and the mean camber line is a line generally curved that's equidistant between the top and the bottom surfaces of the wing so having sorted that out we need to look at what streamline flow is so i'm just going to pop a few uh, I'm going to use blue to show airflow here. So let's do a line like that and a line like that. And roughly at the same distances, we'll do a line there and a line there. Line there. One there. And you can see this is basically the airflow as you approach the wing. And as you pass the wing. So, what does the air do? So the air is flowing in that direction. And really we can say that the wing is moving in that direction. So we're flying forwards. Remember leading edge, trailing edge. And the air is flowing past us. In fact, what I'll just have to do is I'll have to just get rid of that and redraw that to give me a little bit more room. Okay, so there we go. Now, what happens to the air? Well, the first key thing to note is this bit here. This bit, the air can fly... Uh, or the air can pass uh, neither under or over. And this then is known as the stag 
nation point. And literally, it's where the air's hitting the front of the wing, and uh, the wing can't do anything about it. The wing can't uh, move the air up or down. It literally just hits it. So the next bit, as we go above the wing, this flow of air here has to go round the wing. It has to follow the wing. There's not a lot it can do other than follow the wing. So it goes something like that. And you get the same on the bottom. So you get the same on the bottom like that. And you'll have to excuse my drawing. It's not the greatest drawing on the earth. But you'll see that the, the wing roughly has the same uh, the same shape top and bottom with this. It's, uh, it's identical top and bottom. So the next thing to note is that as we go higher or lower, This airflow, well, it can't go in a straight line, so it has to dodge the wing as well, and it goes something like that. And then we get the same thing underneath. So this airflow, it can't go in a straight line because there's something pushing it out of the way, the other airflow, and it does that. Then we do have a couple of final bits of airflow. There's one generally like that, and the final one will go something like that. I won't draw it there because I need that uh, circle in a moment. This, oh, let's get rid of that. This one is known as the free stream airflow. And basically this is air that's passing the wing but is not being influenced by the wing. Now this bit here, where the lines are getting closer together, so they're quite far apart here, but they're getting closer together here is quite important for us. This circle I'm going to use to demonstrate uh, the principle of drag. So we have got our aircraft flying through the air and it's a horrible shape. It's an absolutely awful shape. So here's our airflow coming straight at it. like that. Now, the next thing is this airflow, you've got your stagnation point here as normal. That air can't get past, it just basically gets compressed against the leading edge. You've got this airflow here and this one here. Now, the air obviously wants to flow round this curve and uh, it tries its best bless it but it's not it's not going to have a good day and the reason it's not going to have a good day is because it cannot easily get back to this area so our air gets stuck trying to get back to this area i just put a corresponding line on the top surface as well so you can see a complete picture there we go and then finally we'll do one last line. I know it hasn't got a, a partner on the left, so to speak, but you get the idea. So and let's just mark these up. So this is our airflow. Now, as you're fairly close to the center, you're struggling to get back to this point here. Further out, you can just about manage it. So as you get round here, you can just about manage to get back. But what then happens is the air here can't get back. So it can't get back. So it, it's all over the place and it becomes what's known as turbulent airflow. So that is turbulent airflow. Okay, so we've now got a situation where we've explained the general uh, or the, the key terms in terms of describing your airfoil. We've got the key terms in terms of free stream airflow, i.e. the air that passes undisturbed, uh, passes the aircraft 
uh, be it the aerofoil or the fuselage undisturbed. Um, and then we've described the stagnation point and uh, in effect looked at what happens in terms of the behaviour of the air. Now the next bit becomes quite critical uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. If we imagine we've got a tube, a venturi, that is wide at one end, gets narrower and then is wide at the other end. So our air is trying to get in and it's trying to pass through, it wants to pass through. So that's our air in the middle. And that's fairly straightforward. Let's draw another bit there, another bit there, another bit there, another bit there. So this is all our air going into our tube. And at the end of the day, what we need to have is the same amount of air coming out the other end. And you can measure it by volume, um, but the, probably the more appropriate way to measure it for, for our purposes is by mass. So if you had uh, one kilogram's worth of air going in, you have to have one kilogram's worth of air coming out. Right. So there we've got our airflow going in and the same quantity of airflow coming out. Now, what happens with our airflow? Well, it's squeezing in. And as you can see, it's got to go through a narrower point. So it squeezes in there. Oh, I can never get used to this drawing tool. So it wants to get from there to there, and it has to squeeze through the narrow gap. And again, this side wants to get from there to there, it wants to squeeze through the narrow gap. Now you can see already what's happening is the space available is becoming ever more constrained. Now it can't go where the other air is going. So you see what's happening now is this air has to fit through a smaller space. We've still got the idea that we've got a kilogram of air going in and we need this kilogram of air coming out. So the question then is how does this happen? How do we squeeze the same amount through a smaller gap? And that is the key of Bernoulli's theorem. And it's quite clever, really. So let's let's just draw, if you like, an extreme one at the very edges. So here's our air going in. Here's our air coming out. And let's just show just how dramatic this can be. Because you've got your wide aperture at the beginning and your very narrow aperture in the middle. And what's trying to happen is this is trying to squeeze all the way through that tiny gap. Now, looking at this, there are a few key things that we need to be aware of. The diameter here, the diameter here, and the diameter here. Now, we do know a few things. We know that the aperture here is quite big and here is quite big. So here and here we've got our normal speed and our normal static air pressure. Now the important bit comes here. We are trying to squeeze the same amount of air through. So we've got to have increased speed or velocity is a better way of describing it. Velocity is the scientific term for speed really and, and what it does is it gives speed, a, it makes it a vector so it gives it uh, a magnitude or a quantity and a direction. Um, not massively important to uh, to worry about the direction at the moment so but let's for argument's sake let's say it's going from left to right. Okay so we've got an increase in velocity now I'm no scientist, 
but what I do know from having uh, read around the subject and read the books is the increase in velocity leads to a lower static pressure. This is all very well and good, you say, but what's the relevance of this? Well, the relevance of this is as follows. Let's do this. Let's take that and take it away. Let's do this. Let's draw a line from here to here and make it slightly curved. And you can see already now what's happening is we've basically formed a wing. This continues down. So we've still got a normal airspeed here, a normal airspeed here, and our normal static pressure at either end. However, where our new formed wing is, we've got a normal pressure at the front, a normal pressure at the rear, and normal velocity front and rear. However, over the surface of the wing, what we end up with is an increased velocity, a lower static pressure or a reduced static pressure, um, and then that forms the basis of lift. We've still got a couple of our features left. We've still got our stagnation point. So we've still got this awkward bit here. Oh. Still got this awkward bit here where the air can't do anything. We've still got our leading edge. We've still got our trailing edge. And for the sake of the argument, just to finish it off, we've still got our cord line going through there. So there we have it. The key thing to remember here, this at the very top will eventually become free. I'll keep doing that. This at the top will eventually become free stream airflow. And the reason for that is that, as we've discussed, air still has inertia. So it needs a positive force to try and deviate it from its normal course. And eventually, as you get further away from the curvature of the aerofoil, that force decreases and decreases and decreases, and eventually you end up with your free stream airflow exactly the same as if we had our aerofoil passing through the wind. So hopefully that uh, helps you with our description of terms, uh, our description of free stream airflow and stagnation point, our description of turbulent airflow, uh, and then finally a quick look at Bernoulli's theorem and how it applies to the wing. And uh, with that in mind, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>